So uh, I think we're just gonna start. Uh, I am the first one out, of course, and I'm gonna present the state trends and measures for pollinators in Norway. And I have been mainly focusing on bumblebees, just so you know. I'm mentioning some of the status for the all, uh, other pollinators, but as Langholm Lassuse is uh, mainly working with bumblebees, that is what I am presenting. So, uh, Norway, unlike another, uh, other Scandinavian countries, uh, have in the last decades had a rather low focus on pollination ecology. But fortunately, uh, this last decade, there have been bigger projects on monitoring insects, where pollinating insects such as solitary bees and bumblebees have been a part of a national program for monitoring biological diversity. The project's main goals are to get a better understanding of the populations of the lesser known groups of insects. This will get us data which will make it possible to follow population trends in both common and more rare species. So in Norway, we have registered 35 species of bumblebees, although one species, uh, Bumbus seminovelus, have only been registered once. It was a queen found uh, for the first time in 2013, uh, but scientists collected the specimen and the species has not yet been found again in Norway. But we do take a lot of pride in saying that we have registered 35 species of bumblebees in Norway. On the updated national red list in 2015, and however, showed that there are five species of bumblebees which are categorized as near threatened, vulnerable, and endangered. But uh, due to a general lack of data, uh, it has been difficult to determine the status of bumblebee species in Norway. So, as an example, um, the updated national red list from 2010 to 2015 it changed the status of 11 bumblebee and other bee species from near threatened to least concerned. And this was not because uh, the populations had actually increased from a threatened status to a non threatened status but the lack of knowledge in populations and distribution turned out to show that we had a wrong perceptive of these species status. But in general, there are 87 species of wasps, beetles, and butterflies, which are considered extinct in Norway. And 30% of our 208 bee species are on the national red list. We see that a common trait between the bumblebees which are decreasing are the long-tongued bumblebees. And uh, these are bumblebees, which are often dependent on traditional agriculture and flowers with long tubes, such as uh, red clover and bird vetch. So as these bumblebees have grown highly dependent on the traditional agriculture with grazing areas, diversity in crops, flowering meadows, and rodent nests to make their own nests in, uh, it means that the modernization of agriculture uh, have been a crucial factor for the, de the decrease in the threatened bumblebee species here in Norway. And we can't talk about uh, the Norwegian uh, bumblebee monitoring without um, mentioning Astrid Løken. Astrid Løken is probably Norway's biggest bumblebee researcher and she spent most of her life studying distribution and monitoring bumblebees. Also, fun fact, she is considered kind of a national hero as she was monitoring bumblebees during World War II. She was also monitoring the Germans. So she worked as a spy for the Norwegian uh, authorities during World War II. But in addition to monitoring bumblebees in most of Norway during her active years, she also studied old specimens in research facilities. So a lot of the specimens from the 1800s were at that, uh, this time unidentified. Um, so when she identified these species, um, we suddenly had a lot of val valuable data from the 1800s as well. And this gave us more historical data to be able to compare today's data with, which is highly important. Uh, and as we can see, the, the three species of bumblebees which are vulnerable and endangered are Bumbus distinguendus, Bumbus subterranus, and Bumbus quadricolor. Distinguendus were previously distributed across the country based on Löken's observations, but are now mainly found in two areas in Norway. 
Subtilanus was actually not found for 60 years before it was rediscovered in 2010. And the new data in Norway, no, uh, the new data also showed that the population was doing actually way better than we anticipated. And quadricolored are only found in certain areas. We can see uh, from the, the picture that it was uh, more distributed in Norway before, but now it is just in these certain areas. But the populations are actually seemingly well populated in these few areas. They actually uh, are. But Norway, of course, understands that we have to do something uh, in order to kind of save and promote our pollinators. So in uh, 2018, Norway presented a national pollinator strategy. And this strategy was a product of a large collaboration between many sectors, as listed in this slide. But the strategy, it specifies that the aim is to ensure the continued diversity of wild bees and other pollinating insects, that monitoring to find out more about trends in populations and habitats are necessary, and to know what actions are most effective. And also, that anyone who wants to contribute have the opportunity to do so. The National Pollinator Strategy mentions a lot of sectors, uh, specifically like the agriculture sector, the transport sector, the armed forces and energy, health and educational sector, environmental authorities and private sector, to mention a few. So this uh, National Pollinator Strategy is uh, available for the public, so you, are, uh, you can download it later and read uh, a lot about it if you want to do uh, that later. But uh, with all these different sectors uh, working to promote our pollinators, uh, all of a sudden it made it possible for especially farmers, but also a lot of other people to apply for funds in order to do measures for pollinators. And we have in the recent years seen a lot uh, more measures being done. Uh, urban agriculture, for example, is uh, becoming a very popular concept for entrepreneurs. Uh, as well as private homeowners. So we see that a lot of entrepreneurs who are building new homes or just building new uh, office space, they use a lot of urban agriculture to promote more green areas, uh, which is very popular right now. Uh, the roadsides are also carefully mowed at specific times during the year. So they are not mowed when the flowers are in full bloom, but they are mowed after they have pr uh, produced their seeds uh, so it has time to disperse the seeds so we get flowers for the next year as well. And providing pollinators with habitats where they can nest and feed is also quite popular, uh, both in urban and agriculture uh, landscape. So building insect hotels and uh, bumblebee nest cages, as well as uh, flowering meadows and flowering stripes. Uh, we see a lot more of that uh, than we did 10 years ago. And this is also helping a lot to promote our pollinators. And of course, uh, grazing and mowing with a side help has also been a bigger focus than it has been the, the last decades. And La Humla Suse, for example, we have a uh, project which is mainly focusing on establishing flowering zones and stripes around the farmers' crop fields and other areas on their farm. And this, this has been a huge success for us. And one of the farmers, Justin Svalheim, uh, will talk a little bit more about this uh, on his farm later today. In 2016, uh, many environmental organizations and research institutes came together to make a flower menu. And this is an online information site where you can find different flowering plants which contain a lot of pollen and nectar because a lot of the typical garden flowers, which we find pretty, are not containing a lot of nectar and pollen, and they're more, mostly ornamental. So the flowering plants are categorized into different groups based on what people usually are looking for, such as perennials, uh, wildflowers, typical garden flowers, trees, and bushes. And another important thing about this plant is, uh, list is that none of these plants are invasive plant species with a high potential of spreading. Uh, it has been important in order to fight alien invasive species, which is also specified in the national uh, pollinator strategy, as this contributes to, uh, to a decrease in biological diversity. And that is also 
um, why the concept of using local flower seeds um, have been so important. Because the Norwegian uh, Institute of Bioeconomics are collecting local flowering seeds, which are sold uh, in Norway. So although uh, these seeds so far are just for some parts of Norway, they are working to expand the service to the entire country. By using local flower seeds, we avoid planting out invasive plant species, which can destroy the local flora, as well as protecting the genotypes of the local flower, flowers, which have uh, adapted over centuries, perhaps even millennia. So, uh, with all these measures, there are some good news, uh, because earlier this year, May of uh, 2020, a new report showed that the condition of the most vulnerable bumblebees seemed to be better than what we thought. This again shows how important monitoring is and how little data Norway actually has. So one of the authors of the report actually said, Eisen uh, Rasek, said in a paper that the positive condition of bumblebees are probably caused by these measures with the roadsides and the industrial areas and rooftops which are filled with gravel and flowers and that they are compensating for the old diverse and species uh, rich cultural landscape which are good habitats for these species. So the new national red list updates will uh, probably be released in late uh, 2021 so until then it's not easy to give a um, correct estimate of the bumblebees situation or any pollinators for that reason. But what we can say for absolute sure is that too many species are and will be on the red list and we need to promote our pollinators and more monitoring work for more data is absolutely needed. So let's see. There is a lot going on in the chat. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Let's see. Why the National Pollinator Strategy doesn't include forestry sector? Uh, I think perhaps that should be a question for later. We have Gyura Taito here today. She, she will talk a little bit about the development of the pollinator strategy. So perhaps that is a question for her for later. Um, Magnus Jürgen or Anneli, do you have the questions? Can you hear me? Yes, it was a very good seminar. I have no question. Thank you. Uh, from the chat. No, I haven't. Jorgen, I think there haven't been anyone. Jorgen, do you, have you seen any question? You have answered some of them. Yes, sir, I'm just, I've just seen the same questions as you can see, Magnus. Yeah. I think it's up to uh, to Aaron to ask them. It's for it's for the conditions in Norway, I think. So was it one more time? I think it, you should answer the the questions, Aaron. It's about the conditions in Norway. Questions about the conditions in Norway. Yes. Uh... It's a question from Panilla about insect hotels. Yes. What is the effect of insect hotels on bumblebees and hoverflies? Solitary bees use them for nests, but what about the rest? A lot of bumblebee species nest in the ground. So yes, that is the, um, the main difference between insect hotels and bumblebee nesting cages, because solitary bees are, as the name says, they're solitary. They don't live in this uh, big um, hive with the, <laughs> where the, colonies and uh, so the the insect hotels are for the solitary bees to just leave their eggs and leave some nutrition for the eggs when they hatch and then leave but uh, bumblebees are more like honeybees and wasps they nest together in bigger colonies so the bumblebee nesting cages are kind of like bird um, 
not bird cages, but like bird houses. Um, and you kind of uh, simulate them to look like rodent nests because um, in the wild, bumblebees will try to look for rodent nests and uh, kind of use them as their nesting place. And also, uh, yep. Aaron, so also a question about the, the native uh, brown bee in Norway. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you know anything about the, the Apis melliferia? No, I don't know much about it, to be honest. Um, uh, I just know that the situation for them, as well as the, the classic honeybee, which we have imported, uh, their situations are very different. So the situation for the, the Norwegian brown bee is more classified as a uh, wild pollinator that we need to promote their uh, habitats as well, unlike the, the European imported uh, honeybees. So I'm sorry, I don't have much information about that species. Yes. So, Annalise here, I will uh, read another question. Yes. So it is asked uh, why the national pollinators uh, strategy doesn't include forestry sector. In my understanding, at least clear cut areas are important also for pollinators providing flowers. Yes, uh, I haven't been in uh, any of the development of the pollinator strategy, so I don't know that. But perhaps if there is time later, uh, maybe Gyrotaito has a better answer than I have, uh, hopefully. It is also asked, uh, who are the farmers uh, subsidized for planting flower strips in Norway? Yes, there are some... Uh, possibilities to, to apply for funds in order to plant flower strips in Norway. Uh, it's diff uh, there are different places you can uh, apply for these funds. So some of them are from the different sectors, uh, such as uh, the, the agriculture and food um, department, I think, have some uh, available funds, but also the different county uh, county men, <laughs> if that's the right term in English. Okay, it is also asked uh, how is the situation for Norsk Brunn yeah, in Norway? Uh, I, I don't know what this Norsk Brunn beer is. Yes, that was the question I answered. Uh, yes, you have already answered that, Irene. And I think I'm out of time and I wish you'd move on to the next uh, panelist, which yeah. is... One, one more thing, it, one was thing. Said, it was said in the chat that the, the questions can only be seen by the panelists and not by the attendees. So um, there is a, a question and answer uh, logo down mm -hmm. here, but it was James Henty Williams who is telling about that, that we could ask there. Yeah, perhaps we should uh, move it over there. You can also um, write over where it says type message. You can change from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. And then you will chat to all of the attendees as well. Okay, uh, so those who are sending uh, uh, questions, you should um, check that there is uh, written two and then you should uh, put uh, to all panelists and attendees. Mm. In, that w in that way it will go to everybody. Yes. So all who send questions then check that you send to both panelists and attendees the questions. Yes. Okay. Um... Lotta, are you ready to present yours? Yes, I am. Thank you. I think I will uh, put my camera on. So thank you very much for inviting me to give a presentation at this uh, webinar. Uh, I am going to share my screen and show you a presentation. I hope it works. Can you see it now? Yes. Good. So uh, I'm from the Pollinate Sweden Initiative, a network for, for pollination issues in Sweden. 
So I have been asked to give a short presentation about uh, Pollinate Sweden and the communication activities that we do and also a short um, status from the, the 2020 Red List uh, as well. So I will just guide you through this. And I will not be able to see the chat when I'm speaking. So I do like you, Erin, I will take the, the questions afterwards. So uh, I've got some feedback about the situation according to the red list from Arthur Larsson at Art Data Banken at SLU. And uh, compared to the 2015 version of the red list, we have two less species of bees in the red list, which is a good thing though, but of course a lot of uncertainties as you can see, we have in the different classifications a total of 97 bees on the red list. Uh, uh, and you can see the criteria here. Regional extinct, 16, critically endangered, 8, endangered, 13, vulnerable, 25, near threatened, 33, data deficient, 2, and least concern, 192. So that's the state for for the bees total and for the bumblebees, it looks like this. We have or have had 41 species of bumblebees and now we have said that three of those are extinct today in Sweden. We have three regionally extinct ones. We have one vulnerable, eight near threatened and 28 least concern and one not applicable. So that's from the, uh, the recent uh, red list from Sweden. So if you want to know more about the details, you please contact the Art Data Banken to find out more uh, information. Uh, during the, uh, the last year, actually 2019, uh, the Swedish government put aside uh, uh, 70 million Swedish crowns for in the budget, in the state budget, to be working with issues concerning pollination and pollinators. And uh, you can find more of this in the governmental um, sites as well, but also from Naturvårdsverket, which is the, the environmental agency protection. So they have one of the, um, uh, they are one of the, one, the agencies in Sweden that will work with the pollination and pollinator measures. But it, this 70 million Swedish crowns has been divided into seven uh, different agencies. So apart from Swedish and Environmental Protection Agency, also the Swedish Board of Agriculture, Swedish Forest Agency, the Swedish Transport Admi Administration, uh, and also Svenska Kraftnet, the Swedish Authority for Transmission System for Electricity, and Swedish Fortification Agency and National Property Board of Sweden are involved in this. So it's a very, I would say, a good uh, collaboration or cooperation between different agencies to try to address this very important question about pollination and the status of pollinators. So for the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, they have divided the funds that they can work with um, for different measures. So for example, 15 million Swedish crowns are applicable funding for local measures for supporting pollinators through what is called the LONA uh, so, uh, fundings. And geographical appointed support to save some of the most vulnerable white species is also put there uh, and for 11 million Swedish crown per year. So seven counties, the county administration are, are uh, running this, uh, have extra funding for, for work put for pollinators and pollination. And then also for environmental monitoring for pollinators. So 20 million Swedish crown per year for this. And I've got some extra information about what is going to be done with environmental monitoring. And for example, monitoring of populations, test uh, for identification which pollinators are vis visiting what, and also monitoring pollinators exposure to pesticides and habitat modeling for green infrastructure. So if you want to know more about these, please contact Ola Inge at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can enlighten you more. So that's kind of a very quick review of the situation and we are very happy that we have got some, 
state funding to work extra uh, for measures uh, uh, for pollinators and pollination. So I'm at the Pollinate Sweden network, as I said in the beginning. And we are trying to um, connect uh, all stakeholders within the field of, um, uh, of pollination issues. So we're doing that by gathering a network and we have a strategy where we think that if we can have all these great things going on, uh, being lightened in, or highlighted in such a way that they are accessible, um, accessible from the public who are interested in this question. And we can see we have a lot of interest, a general interest from, from all of the, the members in, or the citizens in Sweden and abroad actually, about the topic. So we try to use our uh, platform, Pollinate Sweden, to use it as for messages and a uh, channel for communication. So in that sense, we can connect the practice, the theory we have about uh, pollination and communicate it in such a sense that it could be applicable for, for others to, to say, oh, I can also, also do things about this. So the funders of the network is, apart from myself, is also Anna Lindlevin, who is communication expert, and we work together to try to get things uh, moving during the year. We have funding for doing this through the National Apiculture Program uh, in Sweden, and also uh, funding from the Environmental Protection Agency in certain parts of it for communication. So by inviting all different stakeholders, uh, ranging from agencies, researchers, um, uh, non-NGOs, uh, working with nature conservation, also beekeepers, farmers, all the different stakeholders within this very complex landscape we have for pollinators to, to live in, we are uh, trying to find what, what can be done, what can we do together, what can each of us do, uh, and try to strengthen the, the initiatives in that sense. So here you can see the, some of the participants in the networks. You also have the garden sector in there, where advisory services, and so on. So it's a very open and accepting environment to discuss things. So how did we get intention? So we had this communication strategy. We, we made a platform uh, where we have information, but we also launched uh, some initiatives. One is called Pollination Week. So that we have a Pollination Week since the first one we had in 2018. So this will be the uh, we have been running for a couple of years, not very many, but I would say we have increased um, the focus on pollination issues during this special week. So we highlight in different projects around the county, uh, in, around in the country, both local, national, regional ones. Here you have some examples from different stakeholders. Yeah. And you can also see this one. Uh, it's another uh, aspect of um, the initiative a national that we have, have been highlighting. It's a uh, bespoke, it's called. Uh, it's a Swedish and Danish, uh, from our point of view, Swedish-Danish uh, project, but mostly it concerns for the North Sea region, also including the uh, UK um, and the Belgium, uh, Netherlands and some part of Germany in this and it's a project about how we can collaborate um, both to enhance uh, crop and also how we can enhance um, for local local pollinators that needs uh, a good approach to uh, have a better uh, diversity. So by connecting uh, these two measures both benefiting biodiversity and increased crop yield, 
we could gain a success. So this could be an interesting project as well. And if you want to know more about this, it's a webinar on the 11th of December. It's also focused on using local seed mixes. So this is also in uh, some other activities that we will uh, open up for during the pollination week. We have a trying to put focus by showing all these different uh, measures taken for pollinators, giving a very positive touch. So you can see we have a lot of hits on Google if you go there. And this year's pollination week will be in May, the 15th to the 23rd of May. And so we would like to address you to uh, please say if you are going to do something, we can uh, raise it on our channels and we can spread the word about the importance of pollination and beekeeping uh, and pollinators as well. Because during this week, we have both the World Bee Day, that's more for the beekeeping context. Uh, it was a question about mellifera, Apis mellifera mellifera, the, uh, the, the brown bee or the, the black bee in English. Um, it's a special day for, for that. And then we have the Biodiversity Day, the 22nd of May, and it's a great spring time to um, really enjoy nature. So that's why we put the dates for the pollination week around these days. So here you can see some of the initiatives going public because when we we go out and say now it's pollination week we also get a lot of attention from other media and they want to raise what is being done and this year 2020 we had uh, also the Swedish royal family uh, promoting uh, in this case it was honeybees because they have their own honeybees but also addressing the pollination question in larger So we try to share knowledge and one way of sharing it is just making the knowledge available. So we have been producing uh, a different kind of posters, uh, brochures uh, and uh, kind of um, kind of called pollination school later on. Uh, that could be that could make this knowledge more available for all interested people. And to show that it's not only honeybees, but also a lot of other uh, bee species and insects uh, working within the pollination. So here you can see some examples of uh, what we have been working on. Posters. We actually got an award for, for these, the uh, best uh, information material of the year, last year. And we also have some other collaborants. It's a part of Plantation. Uh, that's a, a garden um, store. They keep garden stores both in Norway, Sweden and Denmark. And together with them, we, they have used our material in their stores to inform the customers or to communicate with the customers what they can do to help for pollinators. And also internationally, we have been part of Bee Life, for example, explaining about this, trying to raise um, to join forces with the European context. We also be in the EU talking about this. Uh, and here you can see the pollination school that we produced this year. It's more for, for, for kids, but it's also, I would say, a good guide for grown-ups to take part of this. We find different ambassadors uh, working for our course. Mm. We have seed mixes, locally produced seed mixes in, from Sweden, uh, Mayflowers. So these are also uh, being able to kind of for communication. One minute left. Thank you. And we also have one other uh, thing about the, po except for pollination week, we also have uh, invented, you can say, pollinator of the year. It's a prize to highlight in, in the engagement. So the first year was 2017, but it was the Swedish Transport Administration in Gotland working with the roadsides. You'll know more about that later on today, I understand. Uh, and 2018, it was a farmer who became Niklas Mann, who became a pollinator of the year. And last year it was a seed company uh, producing local seed mixes, so called Pratensis. 
And this year it was biologist Ebba Werner for the fight for flowers along the roadsides. Uh, once more, again, the roadsides, and uh, they are very important for the infrastructure for pollinators, I would say. And it's great to see how this uh, prize also gets intention internally. This is from the Husol in Selskapa, this is the farming advisor um, company, uh, and they highlighted they, that they had three different uh, of their employees being nominated for the pollinator of the year. So it's great. And we have our website then as a hub for all of this information, both uh, on the web, but also on the social media. And this is a way trying to get this, the knowledge about pollination, pollination issues, more reachable for all interested members of the community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lotta. Uh, we will just have to move on to the next speaker. Uh, which is uh, Jürgen. Are you ready? <coughs> Sorry, I'm ready, yes. Yes. I'll sure. try to share my screen. Um, just a minute. There you go. Sorry. Can everyone hear my voice? Irene? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jürgen Petersen and I'm from Denmark and I'm representing a small NGO organization called Willebier in Denmark, native bees in Denmark. And uh, I want to tell you about the state trends and measures for pollinators in Denmark. And my focus will be on uh, the agriculture area, the farmed uh, land in Denmark, because it's a lot of area in Denmark. Um, my reference here is the red list of all Danish bees. Um, and the state of wild bees in Denmark is actually based here on the Danish uh, uh, red list assessment from last year. Um, um, and it, for the first time uh, in Denmark, it deals with all the 292 species which have been registered in, in, in Denmark. Uh, um, it is the second red list of bees in Denmark. The first was uh, put out in 2010, but that time it was only about uh, the, the bumblebees, but I'll come back to that later. Just for a start, I want to introduce you for the red list uh, categories. Uh, I think you are perhaps some of you quite familiar with them, uh, but there are different categories we have to assess the, the wild bees into these boxes here. Um, you can find them on the EUCN uh, homepage uh, if you want to know more about the criteria you have to look up there. The situation for the 292 species in Denmark is that uh, some of them, actually quite big part of them, um, is actually not assessed here because they only occur, occur very uh, randomly or we think they are under establishment, so they are not uh, assessed here. And that leaves 244 species which have been assessed. Nineteen species of the two hundred and forty four species they are estimated to be uh, extinct in Denmark um, and when can we consider a species to be extinct? Well, the criteria tells us that if it hasn't been seen in Denmark uh, for uh, the last fifty years, we can estimate that it is extinct. eighteen species. They are critically endangered. Um, 70 species are endangered. 21 species are vulnerable. 26 species are near threatened. For six species, we don't have uh, enough data to assess their risk of extinction. But it leaves 137 um, species that are of least concern. And that means that 
the conditions for them they are i don't know if the conditions are good for them but they have uh, a lot of um, individuals in, in denmark here you can see the <clears throat> the percentages of different uh, different red list groups uh, seven percent of all the species and that's actually quite a big part i think uh, they are extinct 19 percent of them they are critical endangered endangered or vulnerable um, but more than half of the bees they are of least concern but i want to focus on the bumblebees because we have data for the bumblebees now in in, in the red list from 2019 but also from the red list in 2010 and we can compare the chains that have been here for the last uh, almost 10 years and um, yes in Denmark we have registered 29 species of bumblebees um, here you have some drawings of all the species um, but some of them you see here they are extinct in Denmark um, what changes could we see from 2010 to 2019? Well, there have been some small changes. One more species have been accessed, uh, extinct. Um, and one less species now assessed critical um, uh, endangered. I think it's because it's extinct now. Um, the number of species that now is endangered has grown from one to three and um, the number of vulnerable species are almost the same and the number of these concerned species they are also the same now almost the same now so actually no big changes for the bumblebees uh, since 2010. I've shown the list, um, so you can see <clears throat> some of the changes. Uh, the bamboos campestris has actually increased since 2010, and it's the same for the bamboos homilis, which have also increased. The new one that is extinct since 2010 is uh, bamboos ruderatus, and then we have two species that has that have declined. It's the bamboos Sylvarum and the Bambus literanus. Um, the other species that are extinct uh, already back in 2010 is the Bambus barbutellus and the Bambus pomorum and the Bambus quadricolor, uh, which you can see here on the list. Well, if you don't know much about Denmark, I can tell you we have a lot of agriculture in Denmark. It's uh, taking up a big part of the country. Um, almost two thirds of Denmark's area is cultivated. It's, it's farmed land. And it's almost, I think, a uh, world record. So compared to Norway and Sweden, we have a lot of agriculture. And it's because of the geography in Denmark, we have good soil and it's very plain. Um, the area of, with, with forest is growing these years. 200 years ago, we had only two or three percent of Denmark was uh, planted with uh, forest, but it's growing these years. Um, the area with open nature, I think it's declining these years. And that is sad because a lot of the, the endangered species, uh, they live there. And also the part of taking up by the cities and roads and highways and things like that is also growing all the time. So there's not much space for, for bees in Denmark. And so, where do all the red listed bees in Denmark live? Well, the majority of the, the bees, they, they actually live on dry and sandy grassland in, in open landscapes. And as I said, these areas, they are declining. Um, also in areas where we dig up raw material or in military areas, 
uh, they are good areas because they are, there are a lot of disturbance there. Um, open forest, uh, the edges around the forests, uh, and also there was some question earlier about the forest cleanings, uh, clearings. Uh, yes, they are very important because when you clear the forest, you have open land where you can have a lot of flowers. Uh, also the dunes and the cliffs at the coasts are very important uh, areas for both wild bees, heaths, fresh and beach meadows. And also <clears throat> there's a lot of, a lot of small habitats in the aerial land, but in many parts of the areas, uh, they are not connected. And then of course, there are also urban areas. Only a small part of the bees on the red list are found in the, in the farm land. So the conclusion here is that the, the red, red list of bees, they live in, in areas that are not found. And that's, as you saw before, we don't have much of that in Denmark. Well, what th threats do we have in Denmark? Well, I have already uh, <clears throat> said a little bit about it, but the most important uh, reason here for, for losing bees in Denmark, uh, perhaps not species, but individuals, is that we lose habitats all the time. And there's also a big lack of flowers um you should visit Denmark and you will see it. Um, the problem is that tall grasses uh, and herbs and shrubs and trees they grow all the time and uh, and they shed out all the the herbs uh, the, the flowering herbs. Um, as I said also there's a lack of disturbances in the uncultivated nature. Um, disturbances, well, you perhaps think it's not good, but actually it is good because it makes a lot of mess. It creates space for, for flowers and things like that. Um, the landscape is more and more monotonized because we grow more and more um, grains in Denmark, uh, like barley and wheat and also corn or maize. And they are wind pollinated. They do. They don't not. They do don't offer any uh, nectar or pollen for bees. Um, also, we see some waste of nutrients to the immediate er environments around the fields, and that that means that the grass it just grows and grows, and and it doesn't leave any space for flowers. Um, we lose the small habitats in the cultivated uh, areas. We lose the fences, the field boundaries, perhaps some stone dikes are, are removed, the ditches and small sandy field roads. Fandy sandy field roads, we know they are also important habitats for small soil living bees. Um, we have fewer and fewer flowering grasslands with clover uh, as because they are harvested for silage. Um, normally before, at the latest during flowering, uh, the grass is used as feedstuff for, for the intensive uh, cow production we have in Denmark. Other threats are, well, when we treat the soil, when we plow the soil, we destroy all the nest in the soil uh, close to the boundaries. Uh, around the fields, uh, we remove large stones, uh, piles of stones, of large stones, we know they are good nesting places for bumblebees. Dead woods um, could also be nesting sites for at least uh, some solitary bees. Um, pesticides are also a threat in Denmark, although we have uh, some organic uh, agriculture in Denmark, most of the farm areas, they are uh, sprayed every year with pesticides. Um, some of the pesticides, they could harm the bees directly. Uh, but I think One minute the main left. problem here, sorry? One minute left. Well, the main problem here is that <clears throat> it reduces the wildflower 
just outside the, the fields. Uh, some research done in Denmark uh, has shown that. I could also mention intensive beekeeping. It could be in some places a problem for the wild bees because uh, the honeybees, they will, they will eat all the pollen and all the nectars, and then it will limit the food for the wild bees. So what measures do we do in Denmark? Um, well, as agriculture takes up relatively much space in Denmark, farmers and their advisors, they play a very important role in creating better opportunities for bees. Uh, they are <clears throat> doing webinars, or they could be on biodiversity, on insect-friendly fa uh, farmers, uh, as they did yesterday, actually. Uh, they have intensive advice on spraying thrift, reducing techniques in the uh, arable land. They also advise on equipment for fertilizer spreaders, so that loss of fertilizers outside the field uh, is reduced. They have campaigns on wild bees, uh, become a bee-friendly farmer, as they uh, launched two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, and it includes a number of recommendations. Uh, uh, and they are rated. Uh, they also have flower stripe campaigns. Um, as Aaron said in the beginning, uh, we don't have a pollinator strategy for native bees, but it will come. I think uh, the government they have said that they will uh, make such a one, such a thing, and they have invited different organizations to participate in, in that that work. Uh, we are also uh, experimenting with rewilding in Denmark and it's showing very good results and of course I should also mention that a lot of research uh, is done on the universities in Denmark. Uh, the next speaker after lunch, Joko, she will tell more about that. And here I'll show the map uh, that was introduced to the farmers uh, in the campaign for bee friendly farmers. Um, it's a map with uh, 10 recommendations telling the farmer what can he do on his farm to create better conditions for bees. Um, they are rated and perhaps you could see that a thing like flower stripes it's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's rated very very low. That's perhaps surprising for some but uh, flower stripes if the soil is treated and plowed every year it's not much worse for, for wild bees. It should be all the small habitats around the fields, in the corner of the fields, in the wet areas in the fields that should be protected. That's much more, much more important than uh, make uh, flower strips. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jerian. That was great. Uh, we have to move on. Um, Anneli unfortunately lost her connection, so she's on her way to the office and trying to connect from there. So, uh, Juho or Matthias, is it okay if we uh, if you take your presentations first? Yes, it's okay. So then we have Juho, then Matthias, and then hopefully Anneli uh, right before lunch. Yeah, it's okay. Great, thank you. You hope you can just start to share your screen and uh, start your presentation when you're ready. Okay, thanks. So, hopefully you can see my presentation. Yes. Uh, so, my name is Juho Paukkunen and I work here in Helsinki at the Finnish Museum of Natural History, which is part of the University of Helsinki. And my duty here at the museum is to take care of the Hymenoptera collections. So I've been studying bees and wasps for about 20 years. And uh, in this presentation I will uh, have a quite broad approach to this topic, the pollinators and their trends in Finland. So I try to 
cover also other pollinator groups than only bees in this presentation. And first I'll tell something about something general information about the <coughs> different pollinated, pollinator groups and their population trends in Finland. And then a few words about the, the <coughs> red list assessments. The last assessment was published last year. And then finally some information on recent projects on pollinators in Finland and some measures for helping helping pollinators. So the most most of the pollinating insects belong to the four large orders of insects which are shown in this slide. So the flies and the Hymenoptera, the dip, Diptera and Hymenoptera are the probably the most important pollinator groups, and but they are also quite poorly known. So there are more than seven thousand species of in both orders in Finland, but the true true number of species might be even uh, near to ten thousand. And then the other two groups, which include many pollinators, are the Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths, and the beetles. So these groups are much well better known in Finland, and there are about 2,600 species of of Lepidopterans and about 3,800 species of beetles. So the, the most e efficient pollinators of, are of course the bees which collect pollen but uh, some other groups of insects are very common. For example the flies can be common in northern Finland and in Arctic areas, and also in, in mires and bogs, where the bees are usually quite scarce. So now I will show some uh, results from different studies where uh, these population trends have been studied and uh, first here is some information on butterflies. So in Finland we have had this butterfly monitoring scheme going on from the 19, late 1990s and uh, it is coordinated by the Finnish Environment Institute and there is now some evidence that uh, the populations of most butterflies have slightly decreased during the monitoring period. But there are several species also which have increased and dispersed from the south. And as you can see from this picture the fluctuation is quite large during different years. Then we have also a monitoring scheme on moths which has started already in 1993 and it's based on light traps, light trap material. And also in this project there has been uh, a we have found out that there is a small slight decline in the total abundance of moths but there is a large fluc large fluctuations also, also and these fluctuations are 
mainly caused by only one species, which is here in this picture, this autumn uh, moth Epirita autumnata, which actually is not a pollinator at all, but it is very common in northern Finland and in certain years it has these massive outbreaks and it influences the results of this total abundance quite much. Then we, we don't have much uh, information so far about bumblebees and their population trends, but if we look at this distribution maps and how the distributions have changed during the recent decades, we can see that there are some species which have uh, which have their distribution areas decreasing and some of some of these are the northern species which seem to have retreated to northern Finland. For example this Bombus lapponicus which used to be uh, found in as south as Oulu. It, nowadays it's only found in the northern Lapland. But then there are also some species which have colonized Finland quite recently. For example, Bombus ter terrestris and Bombus shrenki. And they have been now increasing rapidly during the past years. So Bombus terrestris was found first in 1993 in Helsinki and nowadays it's already spread to central Finland. But the, the real distribution is quite poorly known because it is easy to confuse with other similar looking bumblebees such as uh, Bombus lucorum. And then Bombus shrenki was found as late as 2000 in Finland and then after this it has been spreading very quickly and now last year it was found already in the west coast or this year. And then uh, I have this slide about honeybees. So the number of honeybees has probably been decreasing from the 1980s until the until 2010 but after that it has probably increased because the number of beehives and number of members of the Finnish Beekeepers Association have grown since then. You have three minutes left. Okay, thanks. And then we have also a, a study which was published in 2017 which shows that the yields of turnip rape rapeseed have decreased from the early 1990s. So this was thought to be a consequence of the neonicotinoid pesticides and their introduction in Finland during the, that time. And here is a table which shows the results from three latest national red list assessments for these main pollinator groups. So in these, the proportion of threatened species have has been quite stable around a bit less than 20%. In flies, it has been much lower, only about 5%. And in butterflies, it has been slightly increasing so now in the latest assessment there were already 18% of butterfly and moth species 
are classified as threatened. And in beetles, the proportion is lower, less than 10%. And uh, the, the average for all organisms is now 12%. 12, 12 Here are a few examples of threatened bee species in Finland. So uh, they are quite often a rare species, which used to be already rare in uh, earlier times. But then there are some species which have declined, like this Andana marginata and Hoplitis robusta. And then now there are also a few northern species which are uh, threatened by climate change. And this slide is about the management of uh, semi-natural grasslands. So there are some, uh, of course, these semi-natural grasslands are very important habitats for bees and other pollinators. And there are now about 30,000 hectares of managed grasslands in Finland. And uh, the, num the amount of managed areas will, will increase in the near future because the Ministry of Environment has uh, given new funding to, to this management and there will be about 15,000 15, hectares restored in the near future. And uh, as Erin already mentioned, uh, we have already started to prepare this national pollinator strategy in Finland also. And uh, it will be finished uh, next year in September. And there are 19 members from different agencies working on this project. And then this year we had this uh, uh, campaign uh, which was uh, had the name Save the Pollinators or Pelasta in, fin in Finnish. And it was uh, started by the, the <coughs> Finnish public broadcast broadcasting company Yle. And it was a very great success. There were many TV and radio programs during this year and more than uh, about 76,000 actions from people around Finland to how to help pollinators were, were registered during this campaign. And then there are also a couple other projects going on. Janne Heriola will tell more about this uh, project later in this webinar, so I will skip that. But uh, then there is starting now a new project next year, which deals with the farms in Finland and how to uh, convert farms to be more pollinator friendly. And this project will be led by Tracy Birch from the University of Helsinki. And, and it, was, it got funding from the High and Tour Nesting Foundation. So I guess this is all, this is a summary slide, but uh, maybe we can skip this. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Yeho. We are just gonna move on to the next panelist, which is um, Matthias. Yes, hello, Matthias Amastad here. I work for the uh, company Heerskone in the southern Sweden, where I am an agronomist. And I will tell you a little about uh, a project uh, called Hela Skone Blumma. So I hope you see my slide now. Yes. <clears throat> uh, the 
the project is a, a free will project. It's not uh, government funded. Uh, we have a, a sponsor from uh, Landstyrelsen, but uh, we all, we um, conduct it. And the idea was to remove uh, farmers' obstacles to grow um, uh, flowers. Uh, so we wanted to make seed available. And and in Sweden before uh, it was quite hard to find um, flower seeds to grow. You have to make your own um, mixes, uh, mixes uh, because they wasn't uh, available. And then we wanted to make create time when it doesn't exist. We wanted to help the farmers to to seed the the flowers, and we did that with working with um, uh, contractors. Uh, and then we wanted. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that it is possible to see it in the f surface is required. And uh, what I mean there is the, that the, today the seed machines in Sweden they are between four and eight meters wide, and the, these uh, small stripes we saw is about one to two meters, uh, and uh, that it doesn't uh, collaborate. So that's why we wanted to use th these um, contractors. And and uh, these kind of projects have been done before. There was a company called uh, Be Urban that started with this, uh, and they wanted to to do the same that we do, but uh, uh, they had a problem to to get out to the farmers and get it done. So, in our company, we ha we have about uh, 500 farmers that we uh, see and work with, and we do the the salmon circle or the cap. Uh, 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 what you call it, uh, yeah, the founding from, from the EU. And in that process, we we discussed the AFR, the ecological focus areas. And uh, and that's why, and in that case, we can use uh, the flowers in this case. Uh, so we, and then we have um, knowledge and resources uh, to maps and the project management that makes this uh, project very good. And then we use partners, I call them partners, they, it, it's the farmers. And then we have uh, uh, agricultural companies in the south of Sweden that are subsidizing with money for the seed, but they also help with uh, reclaim, uh, marketing campaigns and so on. And then uh, we have these contractors, and uh, it was very successful. Uh, the project uh, we could uh, en engage about 250 farmers, and 80% uh, of these farmers had never grown the flowers before. Uh, and we could, uh, and we we were able to grow uh, 600 kilometers of flowering edge zones. Uh, it corresp corresponds to the road Malmö to Stockholm, and we, and uh, and, uh, and we also um, see the 200 hectares of flowering fallow, uh, and that's um, almost 400 football pitches. Uh, <clears throat> and we we can see that the farmers uh, are very proud to be in this project. They are proud because uh, uh, they see that uh, they do something that uh, make difference. They can see the bumblebees uh, in the in the fields. They are sowing with flowers, and they also get a lot of attention from the public uh, that thinks they are doing something good. And and we have reached all sides of. Uh, farmers. We have uh, farmers uh, with uh, small farmers, maybe with 100 hectares or 50 hectares, and then we have big farmers with two to three thousand hectares that are participating in the project. And they have sown something between a few hundred meters for the small farmers up to 10 hectares for the biggest farmers. And uh, we try to um, to let the people know that we are doing this. We have, a, a, have had a marketing campaign as well. And in this marketing campaign, we have always 
been very uh, keen to to highlight the farmers because they are the one who do the work. We only help them to do it. Uh, we to do to make this easy and to uh, help the farmers to get the fast decision and get the flowers sown. We have used two two seed mixtures, one perennial and one annual. Uh, as you can see here, it's uh, we have uh, phacelia as the most important uh, cover crop to help the other crops to come up, and it is a very good crop to uh, to to con uh, conquer a weed. Uh, and uh, this is uh, two pictures from the, the annual uh, flowering mix. And the, the girls with the, to, with the mix is to have a good weed control because we want the farmers to grow this and uh, they won't do it if the weeds will take over. And that's where the phacelia is very important. Uh, she, uh, the phacelia makes uh, the, the big difference and, the, uh, and the, um, conquer the weed. And then we want a long flowering period. We want the, the, the flower to they want the mixture to flower as, as soon as possible after seeding and then we want it to flower into the middle of August. So we have a, um, a mixture that where the flowers will uh, come after each other. And then we also want the diversity in flowers so that we can uh, attract, attract different types of uh, pollinators and insects. And then, uh, of course, we also want this uh, soon to be more than just for pollinators. So by putting, for example, sunflowers in the mix, we will also have a, a winter feed for small birds. And, in the, and then we also want to use these um, flower mixes to promote the Swedish farmer. So it's all we also want, want to have a seed mix that is attractive for people. We want it to be seen when people driving around in the landscape. And the perennial uh, field edges, uh, they look like this uh, uh, when the years go by. Uh, it's, uh, in the beginning, it's quite... Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's intense in flowering and in the later years it's uh, more extensive in flowering. Uh, and as I told you, we, we use contractors and here we have uh, the three contractors that we use uh, this year. Uh, and the way we do it is because it is an efficient use of seed. We can, we can see it all, all the seed that we buy in the project, we can make sure that this will be seeded. If we, the farmers will see themselves, there will always be some seed left that uh, you, you, because you can't see everything. And then we have uh, this uh, correct width of the seeding machine according to uh, the AFR scheme. Uh, and we also want to free up time for the farmers so that the farmer, so they want, so they will do it. If they can do it themselves, they have a lot of things to do in the, in the spring and uh, maybe they want, they, they want to see it. But as you can see here on the pictures, there are great innovation of the contractors. They, they want to see the, at the, a small area and they want to be able to move around a lot of fields in a, in a, in a hurry, as I can say. One minute left. Yes, and we have used the, these partners uh, they have, I call them partners because they only, they just don't provide money to the seeds. They also help us with, uh, with the project in, in any way. And uh, we have make some marketing. And uh, then we also have these side projects that had, uh, have been, uh, yeah, ducked to the project where we, they're looking at uh, how the impact of the strips on pollinators for example, and uh, uh, Kunsbav Embresia Kalandra uh, is also a project. 
that they're looking at this. And, and the project has been very successful and uh, well uh, known in Sweden. So in 2021, we will expand the project from uh, Skåne in the south of Sweden to the whole of Sweden. So I hope you will hear, hear more about it in 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have to move on to the next speaker, which is Anneli. She is uh, uh, back, uh, which is great. So uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. So Matthias, if you have the time, uh, it would be much appreciated if you can uh, answer them in the chat for all to see. I will try that. Yes, thank you. Anneli, are you ready? Good. Yes, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. So, at first I am sorry for the problems with the uh, internet connection, but here I am now and will present the situation in Estonia. A state and trends. At first, bumblebees. Uh, here you can see uh, the results of the fifth Estonian evaluation of species vulnerability according to IUCN categories. And uh, you can see the number of expected, uh, expected number of species under different categories because the evaluation results haven't been approved finally yet. But uh, probably this will not change. And you can see that one bumblebee species is evaluated to be extinct uh, in the region. It's Bombus laesus. It means uh, the species haven't been seen uh, more than 50 years. But actually, before that, also only single specimens uh, have been seen. So uh, there is one species evaluated to be vulnerable, and 20 species, it is 71% from evaluated species, is of least concern. And uh, actually, for 2014, for Europe, uh, it was evaluated at uh, uh, as 20. 63% uh, uh, of the species is least concern, so we have 71, and uh, for Europe it was uh, that 23% uh, of the species is belonging to different uh, threatened categories. It is this red, orange and yellow, but uh, luckily we have at the moment 4%. So we have a bumblebees monitoring in the frame of National Environmental Monitoring Program. Uh, it stopped uh, 2015, but uh, started again this year with a changed methodology. We also have bumblebee monitoring uh, to evaluate the Estonian uh, rural development plan measures related to environment. It started in 2006. We have 66 monitoring areas. And here you can see four figures, three for different bumblebee indicators. Uh, the number of bumblebees, the number of bumblebee species, and Shannon diversity index. And uh, down uh, right side is flower density, which is also evaluated on um, monitoring transects. And the main thing to see here is uh, that during at least this, uh, it's not so long period, but during this uh, 11 year long period, there is no negative trend. And uh, actually, in case of the number of bumblebees, top left figure, you can see that the values are higher in uh, late, latest years. And actually, I have to admit that there is a, uh, one of the causes is also changes in one field worker. But even if I omit this data, the values still are higher also for the last years. So solitary bees, um, it was found that there is not enough data about solitary bees in Estonia to give the vulnerability evaluations. And so in 2018, a uh, project was started, revision of Estonian bee fauna, financed by Environmental Investment Centre. And thanks to that, we have now much more knowledge about uh, Estonian bees. We know that we have at least uh, 271 species of bees in Estonia. And this data also um, contribute to uh, giving the vulnerability evaluations for the bee species. So butterflies, um, you can see that three sp species have been evaluated extinct in the region, and 10 species uh, are evaluated to be uh, 
belong to different threatened categories. Uh, luckily, 87 species, it's 84% of the species are evaluated to be of least concern. And actually, there was a publication in 2019 which said that uh, uh, national red lists of butterflies in uh, 24 EU countries show that on average 27% uh, of butterfly species are considered uh, under different threatened category classes, which this red, orange and yellow. So the average was 27, we have 10% at the moment. And uh, a great input uh, for this evaluation was the Estonian butterfly distribution mapping in 2016 to 17. And uh, more than 1,200 uh, places were checked during this uh, mapping. We also have butterflies monitoring in the frame of National Environmental Monitoring Programme. Here you can see butterflies index derived uh, from this data and you can see that it's uh, rather stable or even slightly maybe increasing. So the uh, situation is not bad based on this data, but of course the monitoring sample always could be higher. And uh, since uh, this year now 2020 actually the uh, methodology was changed a little bit and there will also be more monitoring areas. So uh, from moths, hawk moths are usually considered to be the best pollinators. So here you can see also the uh, vulnerability evaluations for 11 moths, uh, hawk moth species in Estonia and all are of least concern. And the other six species not evaluated are rather rare and the migratory species. We also have moths monitoring in the frame of National Environmental Monitoring Program. And uh, I also asked uh, if it's possible to uh, find data about uh, the hawk moths in Estonia, which contribute to pollination service, because all uh, do not. And uh, I got data about four species, and you can see the species indexes here. And uh, the trend is for two species moderate increase and for two species uncertain but uh, certainly not uh, any decreasing trend here. Uh, hoverflies are usually said to be the best pollinators among flies. In Estonia, we have 221 species, as far as we know. And of course, there is uh, too few data about uh, biology and abundance. And uh, it's not possible to give vulnerability evaluations to most of the species and, uh, of course, not to say something about the trends. And now about the measures, and I mainly talk about uh, measures for pollinators in Estonian Rural Development Plan 2014 to 2020. And actually in Estonia, uh, we have only one measure directly uh, directed to pollinators. It's establishing reaching areas for bees. It started in 2015. It is one year long obligation. And uh, actually it's related with uh, honeybees. So the applicant must have at least 10 beehives or a contract with a beekeeper with uh, 10 beehives. And the applicant must grow at least three melliferous plant species. The total list uh, consists of uh, 32 species. Uh, foraging area should not start further than 200 meters from beehives. And there are management restrictions uh, uh, up to the 15th of August. And uh, glyphosates are prohibited. And this measure is actually related with uh, uh, beehives and beekeepers, uh, because uh, to make farmers and uh, beekeepers to communicate with each other, but actually these foraging areas uh, offer uh, food resources also for uh, wild bees. And here you can see the, some figures about the measure. Uh, left upper figure shows that the last year the area under support was about uh, 300 hectares. And uh, actually, it was only 0.4% from arable land, so it's not very popular. We hope uh, it, it will become more popular and we will also follow, uh, continue with the measure also in the next CAP period. 
and uh, 11 uh, plant species were used last year from the list of 32 species and here you can also see that most popular was white sweet clover, lacy facelia and also different clovers. So we have also some other measures there which may have uh, uh, indirect uh, positive impact on pollinators. One of these is environmentally friendly management, it's fruit and shallow scheme which is applied in, on quite a big land area and has quite a many requirements which are maybe not so strict. So I brought out some requirements which may uh, uh, indirectly uh, have a positive impact on pollinators. It is that 15% from arable land should be leguminous crops. In certain cases due to 5 meter wide grassland field margins uh, should be left or uh, created there are limitations on the use of glyphosites and uh, there are compulsory trainings and one part there is also pollinators. We also have organic farming support and of course in that case uh, no synthetic pesticides are used which is good for pollinators and in addition in crop rotation 20% should be leguminous crops and they also have compulsory trainings. And uh, for both these measures uh, the obligation is why we are long. And here you can see also a figure just to show how popular these measures are or are not. So this uh, SAPS is Single Area Payment Scheme Support and you can see that last year it was almost 970,000 hectares. It's the basic support which almost all farmers supply. And you can see that almost half of it is covered with environmentally friendly management support and almost 200,000 with organic farming support. So uh, two more measures which could indirectly have positive effect on pollinators. Uh, so uh, the first one is environmentally friendly horticulture. Uh, it is known that horticultural land actually could be quite good places for pollinators. So when we try to make this more environmentally friendly. Uh, so for example, the glyphosates are prohibited. Pheromone traps should be used to reduce the use of pesticides. Uh, different uh, biodiversity elements. Uh, should be placed in the garden, for example, in set nests and beehives. There should be protective hedge on each side of the field. And uh, in addition, we have support for the maintenance of semi-natural habitats. And many of the types of the semi-natural habitats provide good food for pollinators. And of course, this cannot be ploughed up. And uh, no uh, pesticides are used, so again, good uh, places for pollinators and both again have five year long obligation. And on last slide, I talked about organic farming support and environmentally friendly management support. And we also have a pump monitoring for that. We have 66 areas uh, from which one third is organic farms, one third environmentally friendly management farms, and uh, one third is control group uh, farms with single area payment scheme, but uh, these are not applying for this uh, environment supports. And the main thing, uh, just to look here quickly uh, on the figures, is uh, uh, to see that this uh, green line, which is control group uh, farms not uh, joined with uh, environmental measures, are uh, in each uh, figure lower than the other two lines. So in control groups, the pump um, indicators are really lower. And uh, one slide also about other activities for pollinators. Mm, of course, education is very important. Uh, there could uh, always be more, but for example, in Estonia, I know that in eighth grade, there is a short introduction about bees and uh, pollination. Uh, raising awareness is very important, different brochures, information days, uh, popular science articles and so on. And of course, there could again always be more. Uh, citizen science is important to raise also the, the awareness and uh, make people interested. We have Facebook groups for Estonian bumblebees and solitary bees and butterflies and moths of Estonia. And um, also uh, citizen science uh, platforms uh, where people can also enter data about pollinators. And there are uh, one minute. Yeah. Uh, there are also measures to reduce the use of pesticides. And uh, of course, there can be other smaller scale activities. 
which I'm not aware of, but I know that some children are placing also insect, insect nests in the gardens and uh, to learn and so on. And a very cute news is also that in 2022 to 2024, uh, pollinators action plan will be worked out for Estonia. It's in the frame of life uh, IP project, uh, forest and farmland. So that's a good news. And thank you. Thank you so much, Eli. Uh, there are some uh, questions in the chat. Uh, you can answer if you want to, but we are five minutes overdue and we're just going to go to lunch. I hope uh, everybody have had a nice lunch. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I hope our experiences with the development of a national pollinator strategy can be useful for other countries as well. Uh, and I'm pleased to note that uh, Finland seems to have picked it up already. So that's very good. Uh, I think the most a strategic grip is to ensure a cross-sectorial process. As you can see on this first picture, we involved eight ministers in the work and they have all signed the strategy. And I think this, this commitment is important both in the development phase and when implementing concrete measures. Uh, the starting point for us was uh, a parliamentary decision in 2016. At that time, we had a minority government in Norway and they voted against the, uh, this strategy in the parliament. And of course, for us in the civil service, this is a complicated situation. Uh, our task was to develop a strategy uh, that the government had no interest in, but they had to deliver a strategy according to the parliamentary decision. Uh, but on the other hand, there was uh, an increasing commitment in the private sector. Many different NGOs within environment, biodiversity, gardening, several scientists and farmers, beekeepers, uh, landscape architects, teachers, uh, local land managers, uh, and so on. All these groups, um, in all these groups we have seen like what i would say a fiery souls with a great concern about pollinator loss and because of this a lot of activities was already initiated and this picture you see here is an example of that uh, a floor menu for pollinators uh, that was produced in cooperation between the ngos and university scientists so there was a lot of idealism and engagement to build on so to, to design this process, we started to identify uh, the different stakeholders. Uh, the responsible ministries, other interested parties, NGOs, research institutions, private enterprises. Uh, and we, or more correct, the directors of agriculture organized a startup meeting with, with all these groups. And this meeting was important for many reasons. Uh, it was uh, important to ensure a cross-sectorial process and commitment from all sectors uh, to build a mutual problem understanding and to establish a common knowledge base. Uh, and this ministerial working group uh, followed the work throughout the process. And the strategy was launched with, with two ministers present, uh, both agriculture and environment. And in Norway, there, it is not a tradition to uh, send strategies on a public hearing, but uh, it's still important to listen to and to understand uh, the viewpoints of all stakeholders. So we therefore invited uh, to written contributions from interested parties, and we also arranged dialogue meetings during the process. A very important basis for the work was the technical report. You see the picture of the front side here. And the Directorate for Agriculture prepared this report with input from a group of scientists and in collaboration with other national agencies in, in other sectors. And this common knowledge base is really important because then we could avoid time-consuming discussions about what is the actual knowledge base. 
like we see, for instance, in, in, uh, in other policy areas in Norway, like the predatory game policy discussions, you know, wolves and bears, uh, with the constant time-consuming uh, discussions. So, uh, to uh, some of the challenges. Um, I uh, have illustrated the challenges with one of our real challenges, invasive species. The lupinus. I don't know if that's a problem in other countries. It certainly is in Norway because the director of the transport uh, saw this out in lots of along the roadsides in Norway, uh, a lot of places, and it's uh, really have it's really it's really a big problem. So a major challenge uh, was and, and still is uh, the lack of knowledge about the status of pollinators in Norway. Uh, we have uh, limited data on the status and trends of pollinator populations. Uh, now the data collection has been strengthened uh, by increasing funding uh, as a follow-up of the strategy. But at that time we really and, and sort of still has little knowledge. Uh, in Norway, there is a requirement for cost-benefit analysis when new measures are decided. And, and in this case, we, we had little knowledge about what measures would be most cost-effective. And, and we also had very no or more or less no data on the value of the ecosystem service from pollination. This was one of the, the important uh, deliveries from the IPBS report in 2016. But that was global numbers and in, when deciding National measures, we need national data. So in, in Norway, with uh, an unwilling government uh, politicians, we were faced with the argument, uh, if the diagnosis is uncertain uh, and there is a lack of documentation, how can we design an effective cure? And how can we apply effective measures? However, this, the technical report uh, we, we had uh, uh, produced concluded that there was sufficient knowledge to implement some targeted actions. Um, and in, in light of the principle of knowledge-based management, with, uh, which is uh, relevant for all, all sectors in Norway, this conclusion was very important for our work. Uh, some more challenges. Uh, this here we have the picture of another problem species spreading from gardens and parks. Um, the, the process of establishing commitment in all sectors is difficult of many reasons. Um, in theory, all sectors have the responsibility for implementing environmental measures in their policies. But in, in practice, the sectors still give priority to their core responsibility, like transport, like energy, like defense. And environmental considerations is given less priority. It's, of course, also a, a question of budget priorities. It's also a fact that the environmental expertise in, and the understanding of environmental issues can be low in the relevant sectors. And this lack of knowledge can be a limitation to the collaboration process. I would say in particular how they link their own sector to what they perceive to be a quite specific uh, environmental problem. Uh, and now what, what did we learn from this process? I think we learned a lot that also can be useful in more or less all cross-sectorial policy development processes. Uh, firstly, do not underestimate the time it takes uh, to mature this very specific uh, problem in other sectors with quite different tasks in the society. It's now, <coughs> it's now four years <coughs> sorry, since the parliamentary decision at the Ministry of Climate and Environment is still working to prepare the action plan to follow up the strategy. But when, when that, is, that is said, in the meantime, we have been implementing already. So the strategy have 
given results, even if the bureaucratic process is ongoing. Uh, however, I would like to underline that the process is just as important as the result. I think this time we spent is not wasted. Uh, it creates an anchorage for following up and we have established new networks. Uh, further, it's important to build on the existing commitment in the society. This is a very powerful force, uh, should be involved both in the process and stimulated in the implementation phase. Uh, and uh, to repeat myself, the cross-sectorial pro approach is important on all levels. On the scientific level, to deliver common scientific basis, uh, on the directorate level, to deliver a common technical report and this make the, the ministries uh, uh, that, that makes the ministries able to deliver a common strategy. And of course, uh, good examples is a very powerful strategic element. Uh, here you see some pictures from different uh, pollinator friendly areas that has been uh, managed in, around in Norway, uh, a cemetery, uh, a local uh, in uh, flowering beds in, in Oslo. Uh, the airports is an important, can be important areas with uh, uh, and good habitats for flowers and insects. Also the roads, the public roads. Uh, and uh, the public road administration is, is uh, working on this, but uh, they, I know they struggle quite a lot in Norway on this, to, to get prior, uh, the possibility to, to have priority to this question. Uh, the construction industry produces green rooftops, that is good, and the defense agency is also managing their areas. Uh, the same, uh, I would say, about the, uh, the power, uh, the Norwegian uh, power operator of uh, power systems, who uh, also have this in mind when they manage their areas. So we have a good, uh, quite a lot of good examples in all sectors, also from agriculture, but unfortunately I didn't put any pictures of that, but Irene showed you some of them earlier this morning. So, so finally, uh, when established, uh, what, uh, very, it's very important to establish follow-up me mechanisms. We, in Norway, we have uh, arranged this meeting place for all stakeholders uh, called the Pollinator Forum. Uh, uh, it is the Directorate for Environment that and, uh, organizes this forum and uh, they also receive annual progress reports from all sectors. Uh, and when developing cross-sectorial measures, it's important to have a coordination on the, the Directorate level. We also uh, uh, give uh, uh, or follow up with requirements to, in our management dialogue, to the directors, to the municipalities, and to the re research institutes, which is uh, important to to make sure that this is followed up in uh, in every sector and in all levels of the management system. Um, I I noted that I had a question about uh, the the forest sector, why the forest sector was uh, was not uh, included in the strategy, but uh, that is that is not correct. The forest sector is also part of the strategy, but they may be less specified uh, with concrete measures, but they should also follow up uh, on monitoring uh, of insects in, in woods. They should follow up uh, with fighting alien species and with uh, reducing the use of pesticides, uh, which they already have uh, done in, a, in quite a uh, high degree. So, so the, the forest industry is not excluded, um, but, um, but it's no secret that in Norway, the wood policy and the environmental policies have conflicting goals. 
so it was not easy to, to get the forest uh, sector uh, active in this uh, process. I can say this. that's that much I can say. Uh, I would li also like to mention before I, I uh, finish um, that uh, we are about to finalize a national strategy for urban agriculture in Norway. And uh, this will certainly also be positive for pollinators. So thank you very much for your attention. This was uh, what I had planned to say. Uh, I wish I could see you all. Um, so keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Guri. Uh, we have some time for questions. So you you already answered the, the question about uh, uh, Skog. <laughs> but uh, there is uh, at least two questions I can see. The one is in the Q&A. Do you have uh, any information about who is a good contact in Miljødirektoratet uh, here in Norway when it comes to pollinators? Uh, yes, uh, I have, uh, if, you, if you need the names, I have um, uh, Per Johan Salberg is uh, uh, the person coordinating the work in uh, the Environment Directorate and uh, Aina Holst, who is the uh, head of that section, is also uh, a contact person. So uh, I, I, th I wasn't able to... Um, uh, remove my uh, uh, um, I, I couldn't see the chat so now I can see the chat I, I can I can write it down hmm I can write it times so to you yes great there is uh, another question as well that says uh, what would you like uh, the environmental organizations to focus on in order to contribute to the conservation of pollinators? Um, <laughs> what, yes, I think um, what we have experienced in Norway is that they have uh, very, very good uh, expertise uh, on the subject and, uh, and that is an important input. Um, uh, of course, it is important that they also uh, confront politicians. Uh, uh, in Norway, we have had quite uh, the, the the NGOs has, have been quite negative, some or some of them quite negative, and said that the, the strategy is not uh, is too weak. It's not working. Uh, I think it would be a better approach to, uh, and I, I do not agree. It's weak uh, because it's quite ambitious. If you look at the, the words there, I think it, they should really go. Um, more tough on the politicians and ask how will they follow up their uh, commitment that is laid down in the strategy. Great, thank you. Uh, do you, any others have any more questions? We still have a little time for that. It doesn't seem so. Then I think we're just going to move on to the next uh, speaker. So perhaps we'll have time for some more questions later. Thank you so much, uh, Guru. Um, okay, so good day to you all. From my behalf also, I'm Janne Heliora from the Finnish Environment Institute in Helsinki, Finland. And uh, I have been working there for about 20 years now, in mostly involved with pollinators one way or, or the other. And the biggest task has been coordinating the Finnish butterfly monitoring team since 2001. But today I will be talking to you about bumblebees. So the background of this project lies in the global concern for pollinators, which we all here today also share. And in, in recent years, the loss of pollinators has also been much debated in media here in Finland. And new actions are on their way to improve their situation. 
perhaps the ultimate fear for how many people is something like this headline regarding China. But fortunately, to be here in the Baltic states and, and Nordic states are still very far from this situation. So much better here at the moment. So about the background of this project here, one of the government's political responses to this concern on pollinators was to launch this three-year research project, so-called Pelyhyoti project in Finnish. And it consists of three work packages. First of them is aims to find out the, what has happened for the Finnish pollinators in the past. So it's we are using historical data on, on the occurrence of pollinators to seek out their past trends. While the third work package concerns the economical value of pollination and pollinators, namely the honeybees and their significance for crop pollination. But today this, this presentation is about the second work package which aims to establish a national bumblebee monitoring scheme for Finland. So this, the main, main goal of this, this task was to design and pilot this ongoing bumblebee monitoring scheme. And as the first task, we started to compile data on, on what are the methodological options we have to do this monitoring, there are several ways to, to monitor and, and get data on pollinators. There are band traps, point counts, transit counts. And for some of these, we already have experiences from here in Finland, and we also collected evidence from other countries. And after that, we selected the most suitable method and, and aim to adapt it suitable here in the Finnish conditions. And after that, we shot volunteers to test this monitoring in practice. And in the end of this project, we will make a proposal for the government to, on how to, how to start this ongoing monitoring scheme after the year of 2021. Luckily, we didn't have to start from scratch there are already several ongoing bumblebee monitoring schemes in the Europe. Most old, oldest of them being ones in the UK and Ireland. The bee work survey has been going on for quite some time already, and it was an excellent example for us to learn learn on how to do things also here in Finland. So because of the previous experiences from other countries, we selected the transit counting as the best suitable method. And some of you may be now familiar with this method already. It is means as a starting point, you design this kind of transect, meaning a walking route or each, each coordinate, each, each recorder separately. And the location of the site is free to decide for the volunteers. And usually it's near their own home or summer cottage or some other place that is quite familiar to them. And it shouldn't be too long, less than one kilometer, half a kilometer perhaps. And it should be on a relatively easy terrain to move. So going along pathways or road margins and it shouldn't take too long to, to walk the transect. And lastly, the, it is then divided into around 10 sections according to each habitat type that there are on the site. And this transit counting method has been used for butterflies for quite some time. It was originally developed for them in the 1970s. So the counting, counting of bumblebees in practice means that you walk the designed path 
on a slow pace at least once a month repeatedly throughout the summer from from may to august and preferably more often once a week would be ideal and while you're walking you should keep count of all, all butterfly or bumblebee species and individuals that you meet within a five by five by five meter area so you don't you don't count the bumblebees that are too far away and these bumblebees should be identified as well as each recorder again either on a species level or, or a species group level or if need you can just count them as any bumblebee individual And the ultimate goal for this monitoring is pretty much the same as for butterflies, which serve as a good model for monitoring, because in Finland we already have, have data for butterflies from 1999 onwards. And also they, are, they have been monitored widely throughout the Europe since the 90s. And we can use the same same method for both collecting data and analyzing the monitoring data. So there is a clear model on, on how to do this work here with bumblebees. And the goal is to produce annual abundance indices, either for each species, as here is shown for butterflies in Finland on the right, or or if needed, then indices for species groups, or at least the total abundance of bumblebees altogether in each year. And from these species level indices, you can of course make different kinds of collated indices for, let's say, species of open grasslands and, and forests separately. And below here you will see a European level butterfly indicator for the grassland species. That's one of the used EU level indicators used for pollinator diversity. But when we started to design this monitoring scheme, the biggest problem we had faced was to find out motivated people to do the recording and also people who would be able to do it. Because in Finland, anyway, there are far more people who can identify, let's say, butterflies and moths than those who can identify bumblebees. So I would say that the group of people who can identify bumblebees in field for, for on the species level is less than 50 people altogether. And these few experts often have many other interests regarding rare species or threatened species. So they often don't have the time, time, time or interest to monitor the common species which are met throughout the country. So for these reasons, we felt that we'll need to train our own, own new experts during this monitoring seem or in the establishing phase of, of, of it. So the solution was to lower the bar for the people to participate in the monitoring and also allow room for inaccuracy. As few people were already experienced to do this work, so most of them are, are beginners who have little or no experience from any insect group. And there's also a problem with, with the bumblebees as a group, that some of their species are quite difficult to identify in the field, even by experts. So for these reasons, we, had to, we took the option of allowing people to, to record the individuals, either by species level or species group level, or if need be as only bumblebees so for the most most beginners 
this is the reasonable way to start, at least in the first summer. So we have been doing this for two summers now, and it showed out that this bumblebee monitoring brought out quite many new people in the company of of insects and pollinators. The people who took part in this monitoring have been quite quite different kinds of people from the more conventional insect experts. Most notable difference being that most of the lepidopterists in here in Finland are usually elderly men, retired men in their 50s, 60s, even 80s. But on the contrast, most of the people who who volunteered for our monitoring are quite young, starting from 20 to 50 years, and, and also most of them are women, which is quite different to the past. So it seems that bumblebees attract a very different kind of group of people. And this is very good for the insect monitoring and, and, and insect com community in Finland altogether because it has brought quite many new people among these and we are expecting that people are learning by doing so within the three or four years up to five years at most we would expect that they learn to identify more accurately the butterfly uh, bumblebee species which are occurring on their own monitoring site because there are not that many bumblebee species altogether at any any given site you usually find five ten or at most 15 bumblebee species so the group of species is not too high so it can be learned with some time and it seems that the recorders have been quite happy with the monitoring scene and most of them are quite willing to continue this work in the coming years but but of course quite many many of them admit that identif identifying the species is quite difficult and for this reason over half of the individuals recorded so far have been other than species level records so here's some some figure from the first year 2019 and we had 70 sites monitored in finland a bit less than 9000 individuals from 28 species out of 37 species altogether so the species pool recorded was quite quite good only only the most rare ones were excluded so about one, one third of the individuals were identified by species level and less than half was identified on, on species group level. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of variation in the amount of recorded bumblebees per site. Usually it has been around 100 individu individuals during the summer within four counts so it is not a very big number of, of individuals at the moment the uh, records for this year are still on the way part of them about 15 are still missing but it seems that we will have about 100 sites for this second year which is quite well considering that the butterfly monitoring has gone on for over 20 years now and it usually has less than 50 sites so already in the second year we have twice that much at the moment there is no analysis on the data of the two years yet but it's it's already seems that this this summer was better for bumblebees than the last one but of course we will have much more interesting data after let's say 10 years or something individual years are 
are quite different from most most <clears throat> most bumblebees so it's very difficult to make comparisons for each individual years and we would expect that the results for this year are available by christmas time so next the results for the two test years will be reported during next next winter and it seems that we will continue monitoring already next summer even though the project is ending and during next year we will also make this official proposal on on how to start this monitoring on a regular basis which this is just a testing phase now and we will need to identify who would be the responsible party is it is it our institute or someone else and also identify what is the funding and other resources that need are needed for this monitoring and this monitoring would pro would produce quite valuable data on the status of our pollinators and help therefore support the national pollinator strategy which is which is still in preparation and should be available next year at this time and the goal is to start functioning on a regular basis in the summer of 2022 well that was all i had to say so thank you feel free to have ask questions if you have yes thank you very much uh let's see are there any questions um have you evaluated the risk of incorrect species identification well we have not made any proper evaluation we have asked people to send us photos in case of in case of they are uncertain of the identification but basically we are relying on the people to use the species level the species group level option if they are not sure about that identification or merely inform give the species as a bumble any bumblebee and that's why almost a quarter of the records was given us only as any bumblebee so it is quite certain that there are also mistakes in the identification but that's something we just have to deal with and we expect that during a couple of years this will this proportion will go down and people learn to do this work more properly mm. Are there any species you don't encourage them to identify because you can't identify them without doing any sort of DNA analysis or putting them under a microscope? Yes, there are. We have identified several species groups which should be used if you are uncertain. <laughs> so, luckily, most people have been quite quite willing to do so. And, and also we don't actually even if they give us certain species names we just largely don't don't believe that they are correctly identified if they are among these difficult species great uh, there is a question but i don't think it's for you as it's talks about strips flowering strips oh there's your camera <laughs> no, uh, what kind of source of information do you have to offer uh, to new people well we do have a just two years ago that was published the first bumblebee identification book here in Finland so that's one of the reasons why there are so many people now willing to 
participate because the book was very pop popular here in Finland. So it has encouraged a lot of people to get to know bumblebees. And we also have produced our own identification material, which is on our website. And we also have a Facebook group which in which the participants can share photos and ask for identification. Great. Are there any more questions? Soriana, before we move on. Will you be here for the rest of the webinar, Hikana? Yes, I will be here. Yes. So then if there are any questions uh, later, you can ask them in the chat and then Jan will yeah, that's to ask them. Yes. Great. It doesn't look like there are any more questions for now. So I think we're just going to move on to our last panelist. This time we're, uh, it is Justin Svalheim, a farmer from Norway. And there you go. Hello. Hi. Just start Hi. when you're ready. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, Thanks to Lahomra Susu for letting me speak at this uh, webinar. It's going to be a little less scientific than the previous uh, panelists and more anecdotal. I'm just going to be so talking about uh, me and my dad's involvement in the pilot project that's been arranged by Lahomra Susu uh, to maintain uh, and promote flowering zones with the goal of benefiting pollinators and specifically bumblebees, uh, the work that we've been doing on our farm. My name is Jostein uh, Liesvalheim. Uh, I'm a grain farmer in uh, Norway. Uh, I'm based on a farm outside of Kongsberg, uh, roughly an hour from Oslo. Uh, me and my dad, uh, Halfdan, uh, grow grains and legumes alongside each other on the farm. Uh, I grew up helping out at the farm from a quite early age and uh, left to study film actually when I was 19. Uh, after five years in the television industry, I came back to start my own farming operation. Uh, my dad is an organic farmer uh, and has been since the year 2000, uh, but he has been managing some conventional fields alongside, uh, which is the fields that I took over when I came back. And I'm currently working to switching these fields from conventional to regenerative agriculture. But uh, the reason I'm here to talk is mostly because of our involvement in the pilot project and the work we're doing uh, on the flowering zones. Uh, in early 2018, I think it was then, uh, my dad and I went to a meeting in Kongsberg, uh, arranged for farmers by uh, Lohm Rasusa. And they talked about the situation of pollinators and uh, they wanted to start a pilot project where farmers would get funding to manage flowering zones uh, to benefit the bumblebees in particular. And we were interested in this, so we, um, we signed up. Uh, it started with consultants showing up from LHS, uh, like Lohm Rasusa, sorry, uh, came to our farm and went around looking for zones uh, suitable for the purpose. Uh, they identified some areas that provided a solid basis for flowers and herbs. And afterwards, we got a management plan uh, by email with instructions on how to proceed uh, maintaining those. Uh, we have three or four separate zones here. Uh, I think uh, some of them are connected by small strips, but generally they're very close together on the farm. Um, the management plan we got, um, basically the instructions were to cut twice the first year, like once early in the year and once late in the year, um, springtime early year and after harvest uh, in fall, uh, with, and then also removing the green matter afterwards uh, so it doesn't block the ground. Um, the results, uh, from this has been like the, that the, um, the overgrowing species like grass species and nettles and stuff like that have been, you know, receding in numbers. Um, just from us cutting it early and removing it, you can just, like tell um, that uh, the it's not the best conditions for them anymore. Um, 
and like uh, they're being outcompeted uh, because we are removing them at these times of the year. Uh, more sunlight uh, will then also be allowed down on the ground, uh, warming it up and providing better terms for the flowers and herbs, which are more important for the pollinators than the grasses and the other stuff that usually overgrew the area. So this has changed. We've seen the green matter go, or the overgrowing species go back, and we see an increase in the amount of flowers, we, and not in biological diversity, but the flowers that already were there. We did see a pretty immediate change where they increased in numbers, but like the overall biological diversity, we haven't seen that increase too much yet. Uh, I'm guessing that's going to take time, but the flowers that were there, uh, we see much more of them. Um, that were already present after we've been doing this work. And that's ha that happened actually quite quick. Uh, we started this, the first year we did this was 2018. Last year you could see change and this year, like it's not the biggest change from the last year to this year, but there is a change, uh, at least in like the amount of flowers. We're also pretty certain without having too much, like it's just might just be because we're looking now, but we're also pretty certain that we can see more bumblebees around the farm. Uh, Maybe it's just because we're keeping an eye out, uh, but it helps on the motivation at least to see them flying around. Uh, as for workload, it's a very manageable workload. Uh, for us, it really helped uh, that we had a plans prepared for us by consultants and La Hombra uh, so that we didn't have to sit down and kind of figure out how we would fit all of this in. Um, we uh, got, um, management plan that was easy to follow and it had e simple instructions um, so we could just fit it in when it fit and it fits really well we are like i said earlier we grow uh grains uh, and so we like in the periods of spring and harvest there is very little time we can set like we can't plan to take any time off to sort stuff like this but uh, have being able to do it before and after we do our main operations on the farm is, has been very important um, for our ability to, to contribute. Um, um, it has also helped um, a lot that the approach from La Humana Susa has been very scientific and uh, not very ideological. Uh, for us, that's not really a huge thing, but I've been talking to a lot of other farmers and um, they're very solution oriented and don't really like talking about, uh, you know, ideas and nice ideas. They want concise solutions. They want methods and stuff. And that's, La Humara Suisse has been very, very good at uh, providing that uh, for farmers so that we know exactly what we can do and what we can expect to see as a result. It's been very, we have been uh, given honest expectations from what we can expect to see as a result of the work. Uh, the cooperation in general with uh, Lomar Susa has been stellar. Uh, they have visited twice every year to check on progress and their consultants have also been registering species at the farm, both bumblebees and flowers. And at the end of the year, uh, we have received a list of the species identified in our zones, which is, uh, that's, a, that's a cool bonus. So you get a list of, to see all the bumblebees that they've seen. And, uh, for us, that's been very cool, actually. Uh, the work itself uh, has been very inspiring, I think, for both my dad and myself. Uh, with the new funding programs made available in Norway, we have already applied uh, and have been granted money to establish more flowering zones uh, other places. Uh, so this fall, we will be cleaning up a large area and try to establish a small meadow um, in between some of our organic fields about a kilometer away. Uh, so uh, hopefully, well, well, we hope we'll see a small benefit of that, but we're doing it mainly for the pollinators. Um, so we're looking forward to get started on that. Um, we as farmers, you know, we are in a rare position where we uh, collectively can and do impact the climate, climate issues overall. So I think it's important for us to try in any way we can uh, to help out uh, and uh, like uh, 
programs like these make it easier for farmers to kind of get away from the day-to-day -day cash crop mindset that we're usually in and uh, provide a path for us to take the more climate friendly and uh, yeah projects take on more climate friendly projects i guess that's what i would say all right uh, that's for me thanks for uh, letting me share and uh, we are looking forward to continuing the work here uh, on the farm if anybody has any questions i can answer them now i think i have five minutes left that went fast all right Thank you. Yes, you uh, are correct. You have some time for questions, if there are any. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you know what kind of, like, how many bumblebees have been uh, observed on your farm? Oh, we did get a list, and I do have it. It's uh, I can't remember exactly. Uh, it's uh, it's more than we expected. Uh, there has we have watched we have seen some um, some rare varieties as well, but I can't uh, say exactly. I would guess somewhere like uh, seven to nine, I think, maybe. No, seven, closer to seven, I would say. But there are a couple of rare ones and then like four or five of the very normal ones. Great. Uh, are there any network for farmers using the idea of regenerative farming in Norway? Do you know that? Oh. Uh, no, very little. This is regenerative farming as a principle is a very new idea. Uh, so there isn't really a network for it. There are some um, companies uh, that work uh, to like consultants you can talk to. Uh, there's a company called Vital Analyse that's we've been using for our consulting. They're very up to date on the science uh, on this. Uh, so if you like, but uh, community wise, there's not much yet. Uh, but if you find one, please let me know because I would very much like to join. <laughs> Great. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, see, thanks so much, uh, Justin. I'm starting a pollinator friendly farms project to produce advisory materials for farmers. Do you have any advice on what farmers need for this? Uh, for our yeah, well, um, I think uh, do's and don'ts. I think if you explain basically the, the what's been helpful for us is uh, not just what we're supposed to be do, doing, but kind of uh, simply why we're supposed to be doing it. And so in our sense, uh, uh, if, um, if we're cutting the fields and we know that it's, a, or we, if we're cutting the flowering zone and we know that it's supposed to happen because we're giving, getting space for these flowers, which appear by this time, then we can kind of adjust, like give, um, there is nice to have some leeway in those plants where we know, where we can make a decisive decision ourselves on when, on how we actually do it. So it's been more beneficial for us to actually have explained um, uh, the goal uh, of what we're doing it and not necessarily a specific date by date plan uh, so we can fit it better into our operation. Uh, other than that, it's uh, nice to have uh, some um, advice on methods to get this done easily. We're very, uh, farmers are very interested in like cost efficiency when it comes to the work we're doing. And so farmers should know that having the right equipment is going to be a huge factor in being able to do this satisfyingly, uh, in a sense. Uh, other than that, it's just uh, anything that helps has helped us in, or helped inspire us, I think, uh, to care more uh, has been a contributor because we do want to get the work done. Uh, and I can't say that that's something that happened on its own. That's been instilled in us, I would say. Yep. Great. Uh, I have one more question here. Uh, what do you think is the best way to convince more farmers to involve themselves like you have done? Um, uh, it's, that's uh, hard. The farmers are very stubborn and we're very... <laughs> It's, it comes with the territory. It's a traditional, uh, it's a traditional line of work. Uh, so people are used to doing it the way it's been done on their farm. Well, so uh, convincing people to care, uh, I think, is where you need to start. Uh, 
because uh, farmers are very, they're very interested in doing stuff they care about. Uh, so I guess if you can get farmers to care in a sense and uh, through the, for different farmers that will be different uh, uh, That will be different methods. So somebody will care more about the value of having pollinators um, Lots of pollinators in their operation and some will care more about the like biological diversity Some people care actually about having very nice uh, meadows around their uh, Farms and stuff so so like the the, the way to convince the farmers uh, very unique. I don't think there's a one size fits all for farmers. Uh, for me, it's just been I'm I want to be I want the farming operation to be better for the environment, uh, but not everybody has that convince uh, or conviction. Yes, I completely agree. I also think that for most people, uh, having knowledge will create uh, engagement, but yeah, that doesn't th work for everyone. Yeah, I think. Uh, if, if people learn, uh, then they will care naturally if they have the capacity to, I think. Yes. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think that's it for the question. Uh, we should be closing up. Thank you so much, uh, Justin. No worries. No worries. Oh, yeah. Right. About the link, Rebecca, I've seen, uh, I am actually a member of that one. Uh, that's not specifically regenerative, but they overlap very much. So, but thanks. Yes. Um, can we have a list of all attendants on this meeting? Those who say okay to share their email address. Um, can we do that? No, I don't think we can. Uh, if people want their emails shared with this network of people being here, uh, they can, um, we can send out a form uh, where people can uh, answer the form if they want their emails shared. I think that would be the best solution uh, so we don't give out information that we are not allowed to do. Okay, so um, this is it. Uh, this was the webinar. Uh, I want, just want to say thank you to everyone who attended this web webinar. Uh, it's been a lot of participants, more than we actually thought uh, we would get. And uh, some people have come and gone, and some people have left uh, in the middle, and that is completely okay. Uh, we understand people have jobs, and perhaps they just wanted to hear a specific person talk, and um, didn't, wasn't really interested in the rest of it. And people are different, and that's okay. But thank you so much to all of the panelists uh, for your speeches. Uh, They've been great, uh, been so much knowledge, and uh, I have learned a lot, as I'm sure many here have. Uh, thank you to the attendees in the chat who have been uh, answering so many questions and having uh, the discussions. It's been very interesting to read. I want to try to uh, copy as much uh, information from the chat as possible, so that will be available uh, to others as well. And of course, I wanna thank everyone who has uh, worked on this uh, webinar that uh, is uh, Annika and Magnus, Eneli, Jürgen and Jenny. Uh, this webinar has been great and at least in my opinion. Uh, so we, I think we did a great job. And of course, thank you to the Nordic Council of Ministers who have funded this webinar. Uh, that would not have been possible without you. So. As I said earlier, even though it's very sad that we couldn't go to Sweden and have the seminars there, I think it has been great to have such a large number of participants uh, from around the world in this webinar. So that has been great. Uh, perhaps we will do that next year if uh, there will be a seminar or a webinar in 2021. Uh, we will try to keep you updated on that if that is possible. Uh, just some general information. Um, as we have said as well earlier, we are we have recorded uh, the webinar. So uh, as long as there are no te uh, technical difficulties, we will post uh, the webinar online and we will send it to them to you uh, from in your emails. Um, and we will also uh, create a, some sort of platform where all the the presentations, the powerpoints, and the PDFs will be available to those uh, who uh, say it's okay for us to, uh, to publish them. 
so then you can share this information with anyone you think should have been here today uh, and to everyone who couldn't be here today and if you want to just re-watch uh, some of the, the speeches again so is there anyone of the panelists who wants to say something before we wrap this completely up? 